So welcome to the Common Room, everybody, and this event with Resolution Foundation today. I'm Liz Shutt, Director at Insights Northeast, and we've been really delighted to work with Resolution Foundation to put all of this together. Um, just to say a few words about Insights Northeast, in case you don't already know who we are. Um, we're a collaboration between the region's universities, uh, the Northeast Combined Authority, and we're also working with the seven local authorities, NHS Trust, and the Integrated Care care board and we're, we're working to make a positive and long-term impact for people in the northeast by connecting the region's policy makers to evidence and actionable insights within the universities um, we're, we're looking across a range of themes so health and well-being inclusive growth climate action all of which have relevance for today's discussion and we're currently working on a range of challenges from from policy makers across those spaces i mentioned so some of the issues we're thinking about are how to make innovation investments more inclusive new finance models for local government, priority interventions to reach net zero, and prevention and public service reform, amongst others. Um, there's a really rich and dynamic policy-making community up here that we're working with, and we're finding a, a huge range of challenges that we can work on, particularly in the context of the new devolution deal. Um, and alongside some of those kind of more granular policy interventions that we're thinking about with those policymakers, we're also thinking about how, how can we address some of the entrenched long-term and, and complex underlying drivers that are affecting outcomes in the northeast and that's where i think work like the, the that we'll be exploring today really help can help us there's a huge amount of of understanding about the depth and uh, of some of these issues but not that much knowledge about what we can do about them and that's that's the work that i and e is hoping to help with and and we look forward to hearing from from all of you and the panel today about about your thoughts on that and um, so I'll hand over to Torsten now. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. <laughs> very echoey. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. Thank you all for uh, coming. It's a great turnout, especially when you could have gone home and had a fun uh, time. But the, um, uh, so the those of you who don't know, the Resolution Foundation is an economic research institute focused on the living standards of households on low and middle incomes. Those of you that like that being more specific, it means people on incomes below £30,000 a year, so the bottom half of the income distribution. Over the last two and a half years, um, we've been doing a big project jointly with the London School for Economics on what should the country's, the national economic strategy be, with the prior bit being it hasn't been going that great. Anyone that thinks it's been going really great, you probably want to leave, because um, we're going to go through some of the, maybe it's not going that great, but I'm pretty sure looking at all national polling, the majority of you probably don't think it's been going great because you've been alive during it and you've seen it happen. So we're going to touch on some of that in a second. But the project was really focused on not just, OK, things haven't been going great because that's very easy for people to say. The, um, the question is, what do we do about it? Because that, in the end, is what we're all about. So the project was focused on that from a national perspective, focusing on what the country is good at, not just what's been going wrong and how do we do better in future. And we published a big report in December called Ending Stagnation. You see what we did there. The, um, and you can go read it. It's free on the website. In fact, are there any copies here? We're not handing it out, disgraceful. The, um, anyway, we can have it for free on the website and that will save the planet and the trees too. The, um, setting out what that looks like from a national perspective. But we're also conscious that national economic strategies do not make up local economic strategies and different places have very different uh, ways that they pair part in that national economic strategy. Cheshire is going to be producing chemicals and kind of commuters for some time. Derby is going to be doing airplanes and different things are going to be happening in different places. So we're spending lots of this year around the country listening to other people about how their region or their city or their nation uh, fits into that question. And that's what we're doing here in the Northeast today. Um, so to help you do that, first of all, you're going to hear from Cara, who's one of our senior economists at the Resolution Foundation. She's going to give you just, I promise you, the, the book is very long, so she's not going to do that. She's going to do only a few minutes of slides, just giving you the headlines of what that report sets out. And then we've got a great panel to help kick the conversation off before we hear from you. So first of all, you're going to hear from Abigail Paulson, who's the Managing Director of Glass House, or The Glass House, sorry. The, um, and then you're going to hear from Henry Morrison, who's the Chief Executive of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, which is a business, business and civic leadership partnership organisation. And then you're going to hear from Beth Russell, who is the second Permanent Secretary at the Treasury um, and looks after the Darlington Economic Campus just down the uh, road. And in the dawn of time, Beth and I work together. Um, but bad things were happening then, so we probably won't talk about it too much. That's when we were nationalising banks, and we thought that was as bad as it could get. Turned out we were wrong on that, along with everything else. So that's the plan, and then we'll have questions and we can uh, talk, and those of you that have failed to get yourself a drink can kind of regret having made that lifestyle choice. Sound like a plan? Good. Cara, what's in the book? Great. We 
see some slides? Perfect. Great, so as Torsten said, I'm going to be giving a very quick summary of a very long book here, um, but looking at our research um, over a two-year inquiry um, to what the UK needs to do to escape economic stagnation. So I'm going to start out with a problem. Um, we've seen a really significant slowdown in productivity since the mid-2000s. That's this um, red line on this chart. And a far larger slowdown in productivity than countries we might see as our peers, like France, Germany, and the US, leaving us with over a decade of relative decline. Why should we care about productivity? Why should we care about, about GDP growth? Who does that really affect? Well, the crucial answer is it's all of us, and that's this blue line, um, because of the slowdown we've seen as a result of this, this, this stagnation, this productivity slowdown, the slowdown in our wages. Um, average annual pay would be about £10,000 higher today if wages continued growing at the early 2000s pace. And worth, again, talking about the kind of international comparison here, this was not inevitable. Stagnation to this degree has not been happening everywhere. We've fallen further behind the US, France and Germany. But just to add, add to the sort of grim picture here, this is not the only challenge the UK faces. We've been living with stagnating wages for the past 15 years, but high inequality has been a problem for twice as long. Um, as you can see on this chart, inequality rose really dramatically during the 1980s, and it's since stayed very high. We're the most unequal country in Europe, and only the US is more unequal out of other rich countries. So taking the stagnation in wages on the first chart and high inequality together, we're both poorer and more unequal than many countries we like to think we're similar to. And that's a particularly toxic combination for low to middle income households. So if you go on holiday to France or Germany, you might think these are countries that look similar to the UK, but the real difference is among living standards in the middle of the income distribution as well as among poorest households. And these are really big differences. As you can see on this chart, this is incomes relative to the UK for these different, um, different economies, for Germany, the Netherlands, France and Italy. Um, both at the sort of bottom end of the distribution, the top and the middle. And you can see here that while a high income household in the UK is about 5% richer than an equivalent household in France, a low income household is on average 27% poorer. So these are really significant gaps, particularly for low and middle income households. And we know as well on top of this, the UK has really significant and persistent income gaps between regions. Um, in the northeast, disposal incomes were actually lower back in 2004 than they were in 2019. Um, so a real problem we've seen in, in stagnation. And perhaps unsurprisingly, that's left a lot of people across the UK, and including the northeast, um, feeling that their local area has been headed in the wrong direction. So this chart is the proportion of people who said their local area had generally declined in recent years. So faced with these twin challenges of low growth and high inequality, the UK is in desperate need of an economic strategy. And this is going to require us to be serious about growth. What does that mean in reality? It means understanding our economy and making our basing our strategy on our strengths, as well as investing in our future. So starting with the first of those, understanding our strengths. Now, our report was mainly looking at the UK as a whole, um, which you can see on this chart is a service of superpowers. This is our exports of, of, of services. And you can see we're just behind the US and much higher actually than France and Germany. Um, as Torsten said, that isn't to say that different parts of the UK shouldn't specialise in different economic activities. And you'll know much better than we do what that is in your, your specific local area. And we'll hear more from the rest of the panel on, on the North East um, shortly. Um, but for the UK as a whole, services are a really important part of our overall strategy in terms of everything from trade to education. We can see a little bit looking at Newcastle, looking at Tyne and Weir, how this starts to play out. Um, so as we would expect for a city, Newcastle's economy already reflects this services dominance, but 86% of employees work in some kind of services industry. So that's the top two kind of categories here. Um, but it's also clear that in the rest of Tyne and Weir, so particularly Sunderland here, manufacturing is very important. So the bottom kind of bars you can see here as well. But what's that mean for a strategy? Well, the UK's key weakness um, is that given how important services are for the UK as a whole, um, far too few of our cities currently look like successful services economies. All of England's biggest cities outside of London currently have productivity levels lower than the national average. And many, as you can see on this chart, including Newcastle, um, are poorer than their equivalents in somewhere like France. Um, 
So if we want to catch up with, with France and other kind of economies we'd see as our, our peers, then we need to boost the UK's second cities and produce and prioritise its overall strength and services, but also protect the success stories we have in manufacturing. As you can see, Sunderland's actually quite high up this distribution on this chart. So we need to prioritise kind of services in our economy and boost our, our cities outside of London. But another important part of boosting and being serious about growth is also comes through investment and, and how we become an investment nation. As you can see on this chart, it's the swathe of advanced economies. We've been right at the bottom in terms of the amount of investing we've been doing. We've had the lowest investment in the G7 for the past 40 years, and that shows up in crumbling schools, fewer kind of MRI scanners per person than a lot of other sort of peer countries. Um, and part of that problem is from business investment, um, where we def desperately need to reduce the costs of investment. Planning applications in the UK are five times more expensive than they were 30 years ago, but also boosting government investment, um, where investment's been volatile and often the first thing to be cut when governments have been squeezing budgets. So we need a serious strategy for growth in terms of both our cities and in terms of boosting investment. We need to be just as serious about bringing down inequality. And we can see the huge challenge the UK faces in our cities in this chart, which is the share of GCSE pupils achieving level five plus in England and, math, English and maths um, for both um, children eligible for free school meals and other pupils. You can see the huge gaps between those, those two, two groups and Newcastle um, similarly seeing some really huge inequalities already. The good news in terms of inequality is that recent gains in employment that the UK have seen has benefited the poorest households, but there's still a long way to go and we need to build on this and prioritise particularly good jobs with the right to stable and consistent employment, as well as adequate sick pay, as well as a strong safety net um, for those outside the labour market that increases working age benefits in line with earnings and removes the sharpest edges of our benefit system so that the benefits of stronger growth and income growth are shared across, across the economy. Final point I'm going to make before we pass back to, to everyone else is that we want to make sure that, that rising housing costs don't raise the benefits we could get from stronger growth and higher wages, then building social housing is vital as cities grow. Building rates, as you can see here, have slowed down over the past 10 years in time and where, um, as they have across England, and particularly in properties for, for social rent, which is the cheapest and most secure form of, of housing. So I set out some, some quite significant changes that would have to take place in our economy. Why should we do all this? Why should we bother? Well, the answer is that there's a really significant prize at stake and a lot of catch up potential. It's one of the benefits of falling further behind is that we've got a lot of gaps to catch up. Um, so if we manage to close the average income and inequality gaps we have with these countries marked in black here, so the Australia, Canada, France, Germany and the Netherlands, countries that we've long considered our peers and they're not necessarily the most equal or the richest countries in the world, so arguably quite achievable targets. If we manage to close those gaps with these economies, um, the typical household in the UK would be 25% richer or £8,300 better off. So there's a huge challenge that we're facing here, but there's a lot to play for. Um, and on that note, I'll pass you back to Torsten and the rest of the panel. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> While you were all watching Cara, I was watching a man called Rob at the back of the room who's unloading copies of the book. So they are, which is good because those, even if you couldn't see those slides, it doesn't matter if he was called Rob, but he is called Rob. They, um, you will get a copy of the book at the end. And so if you didn't manage to see the slides, you'll be able to get a much longer version um, at the end. But hopefully that lays out for you the scale of a challenge. I was just going to give you one more fact to focus on in terms of, well, two facts actually on the scale of the challenge. So incomes in the Northeast. The, um, so you all know incomes in the northeast are a lot much lower than lots of the rest of the country. The, um, but the change over time is what we should focus on in terms of what's happening to people. Right? And we want to know why the cost of living crisis was really high. I'm sure in your area, like in mine, you saw food bank queues getting longer when we were allowed out of our houses. Again, if you look at incomes in the northeast in 2019, they were no higher than they were in 2004. So 15 years of no growth going on. So this stuff really matters. And that's why when, when things like a cost of living crisis come along and we have to pay for higher imported gas bills, things get really difficult. Now, these things are more fun these evenings if there's a bit of audience engagement. So we're going to lure you in with a bit now. So here's our first question. There'll be some others later. And it's a safe space. You don't have to get it right. How much richer is the average 
American now than the, the average Brit. Who wants to kick us off? Who's bold, brave? Who wants to make the country a better place by guessing? Good. Go, sir. $20,000. I will do it in percentages because I don't want to get into an argument about exchange rates. Yeah, 30%. What do you say? 30%. 30%. Okay. Anyone else? 50. 50. Right. Okay. So let's take your 50. We're now going to have a vote. Who thinks it? 50 is a lot. All right. Who thinks it is less than 50%? Hands up. How much richer the average, the average Yank and the average Brit? Okay. Who thinks it is more than 50%? I'm going to call you the depressives. <laughs> the depressives have it. It's 60% now. It is 60%. Right. Why do the people in New York have bigger houses? In New York, have bigger houses than the average person in the UK as a whole. Not in London, in the UK as a whole because they are much richer than we are. And that's what happens when you don't grow your economy for year after year after year. And so it's perky, I just said it was a bit of engagement to get us going. Right, luckily, Abigail is much perkier uh, and is gonna tell us what's going on. So Abigail, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I run the Glasshouse International mm -hmm. Centre for Music over the uh, other side of the river, and we're coming up to 20 years old. We run a performance programme, music education programme, train artists. We serve the region and are based in one of the kind of symbols of the city. Our building finds itself on most pictures of Newcastle Gateshead. We run a conference, the biggest conference events business in the uh, region, so have a uh, skin in uh, this game. But I'm not going to talk about my organisation from my organisation's perspective. I'm going to talk from the perspective of the creative industries more broadly, and I'm going to talk about three things. Firstly, what the contribution of the creative industries uh, can be to the matter of growth. Secondly, um, what the um, how that happens, and thirdly, what um, might need to change in order for more of that potential to be released. I think the good thing about Newcastle Gateshead and the North East is there is some proof of concept here in that investment to date in um, the creative industries has been uh, really good and there's been um, some impact over the last 30 years or so. There could have been much more, but there's loads of potential and that is a picture that we see across the, the country. It's a sector that um, on the one hand is experiencing and um, really struggled during the pandemic. It's experiencing huge challenge, but on the other hand has huge potential. It is the fastest growing uh, sector in, in the UK and has much, much further to go. So the two, to my first point, the two areas where it can contribute both nationally but I think also pertinent to the region under a new combined authority are firstly around economic growth and um, underpinning that um, the work that the creative industries can do can go right to the heart of child poverty so it can get right in there at the, um, at, at the outset and um, address this matter all the way through the system. And then the second thing is in, in internationalism and positioning the country and a region in the, in the world. The creative industries have an absolutely unique role to play in that kind of both soft and hard power. So I guess it's both an internal and external contribution that the sector can make. What does that mean in terms of the, the kind of ways in which that happens? Well, I think there are three key areas that the creative industries are contributing. The first is around uh, pride of place, and that pivots around the well-being and um, the quality of life of those who live in a region or, or a place. And secondly, the prospects for investment, uh, inward investment, and the prospects for tourism. Creative industries are time and again the thing that gets investment over the line. After all, the hygiene factors have been checked in a decision of whether to bring something to, to a region. So there's, um, that's, that's the kind of first area. The second is in skills and in building a workforce. And that's twofold. The first is there's a, an entire sector that needs populating and, and growing with a set of, of, of skills uh, and an education system. But the, the other area is that what's coming through creative subjects benefits a really, really wide range of disciplines and areas. So engagement with creative subjects at school and then through skills, skills building doesn't just feel, uh, feed the creative industries, it feeds science and tech and kind of wider set, set of sectors. 
And then finally, um, the area where um, we see impact is just the, the generation of uh, cash. So in the city here, we've seen um, just my organisation, for example, over its history has contributed a half a billion pounds to the local uh, economy just through the activity that these organisations are undertaking, which is generating cash. And particularly in a place like this, that actually registers. It's not a kind of um, a corner of things. So final um, opening remarks to make, there are, I think, are six areas where if um, policy and our approach shifted, this sector could really accelerate its contribution to UK PLC. So the first is around building a workforce, a much more concentrated uh, approach to cultural education within the curriculum and investment in creative education beyond that. We're well overdue curriculum reform and STEM should become STEAM. There is absolutely no need for those two things, for arts and science to be uh, separate things. And then beyond that, for a much more serious and thorough approach to skills and, and training across a very wide range of, um, of areas that can feed this sector. Second area is reform on the way that freelancing works. So freelancers make up the, a really high percentage of uh, the workforce in um, the creative sector. Um, if across the piece in this country we had a different approach to that, we saw at the point of furlough, it, would, it kind of really sort of went up, didn't we? But if we could make a kind of shift um, in that, that approach that, that we take, that would, that would supercharge uh, this sector. Third area is investment um, in um, activity and in the infrastructure. So to use an example, um, so you have, um, get, so Cara, Cara referred to investment in schools, in hospitals, in, um, uh, in transport infrastructure. We need to see cultural infrastructure sitting alongside that. We've got a set of bil buildings and assets that the Millennium Funds, for example, invested in. We need to kind of renew those and continue to, to grow. But we also need to invest in the making and the kind of creation of, of work. Third area is around research and development. Time and again, this sector is brilliant at seeding uh, new um, research and new ways of, of doing things, but we need to put much more into that and kind of really pull that, pull that through. It's an extremely connected uh, sector and ecology, which has uh, very, very effective ways of feeding itself. If that, if that kind of starting point of R&D was stronger, it would go so much further. Fifth area is around um, supporting the way that we approach intellectual property and uh, AI. That's both releasing potential and about protection. The creation of uh, work is a really kind of unique uh, matter in that. Clearly, there's plenty of read across, across with what's going on in science and tech. We need to take what we know and are doing there and bring it across to the creative industries. And then finally, um, the area that um, will benefit from uh, support is around export and just really, really in the context of Brexit, using this as a calling card for the, for the country and um, pushing the creative industries into Europe and beyond as, as, a, uh, as a kind of representation of what Britain is in the 21st century. Great, thank you very much, Abigail. <laughs> Lots in there in terms of overlapping a you know, particular sector rather than just thinking about all sectors and, and in a particular uh, place. Speaking of place, I think Henry claims he's home. I am home, yeah. So I, I, I'm very uh, grateful uh, to now have a job that means I spend much more time back in the North East. So uh, I spent my misspent youth, lots of people uh, did things in their youth they might regret. Uh, I spent it in local government uh, here in this uh, fine city and I don't regret any of it. And um, it's, it's from that perspective I suppose I offer some thoughts this evening really, which is that um, I was part of an administration here that uh, under the then Vice-Chancellor, uh, which is in at Newcastle, which is kind of relevant and insights northeast, kind of hosted events, uh, seeking to undertake a fairness commission to think about what local government could do to address the inequalities in the city. But fundamentally, 
many of the things, the number of the rubrics and others who were involved in that piece of work, many of those things were not within the control of that institution. And that's kind of the point about why devolution matters and why it's so important that Torsten, Cara and friends from Resolution are here this month, is that there is a tangible change in the environment that didn't exist when I was here uh, over a decade ago. Because some of the tools to make the, so the sort of change we're talking about are now here. So we can talk about, and Cara's alluded to it, we're particularly MPP interested in education in long-term disadvantage, particularly amongst high impact groups, so particularly the poorest children who are persistently poor in a white, black Caribbean, Roma, who have particular characteristics that mean they perform much worse than the rest of disadvantaged children. North East doesn't just have more kids on free school meals, lots of schools are 50% free school meals at secondary school, but it has 10% of those persistently disadvantaged children from those high impact groups. They, they make up 2% of out of London. So there's a lot of talk, uh, and it's very controversial about, about the great success of London Challenge, but part of that is that the demographics in London have changed quite a lot. London challenges. So, and that's the concept that, that London schools did get a lot better. And I do agree that there has been, happening in trust, lots of good things were done in London. But broadly, there was a rising tide that did lift all boats in London. And the issue is in the North East, there are lots of excellent schools, but schools do not determine outcomes. Uh, and Ian Mearns, who's the MP for Gates and I, spend lots of time arguing about value-added league tables education because you don't really know how good schools are because all you see is their results. You don't see broadly, what they're doing based on the demographics of those children. And when we do that, we working with Bristol University. There are some good universities, not in the North East, not in North England. Uh, we look at, uh, at performance across the country. And actually, uh, many schools in the North of England do very well, despite the intakes they have. But public policy doesn't really recognise the fact that that is actually the case. So we, 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 we conflate, I think, how our public institutions are doing with how much money they can raise because they have low council tax base and the realities of the public environment in which they're operating. And I'm a strong proponent of that need to stop blaming local government for all the things that can't change. And we need to allow the local state to do a lot more for itself. And that includes raising a lot more of its money. So in Hartlepool, for example, you will pay more council tax if you live in a 150,000 pound house than someone in Westminster who lives in a four million house. And the, the really perverse part of that is that the low council tax base in Hartlepool also means that it doesn't matter what Hartlepool does, they can put the council tax by the maximum every year, which they do usually do, every year, but they do it most years. And most local authorities in the North East have done that in the last round. But they don't have any more money because the cost pressures that affect local government are disproportionately affecting those sorts of places. So the, the nature of the crisis in local government funding, how that interplays with the positive things in devolution is that some things are going in the right direction, some things are going in the wrong direction. And what we need is a joint approach that says we need an empowered local state that is able to address some of the things that Cara was talking about. And I would, I think the problem statement, I think we all basically agree about. And the one thing I would add is that the Northern Way, which Richard in the room and others here will remember, which was a forerunner to my organisation and was a kind of John Prescott thing. This is not a new idea, like that, I mean, it's not new. But what that started with was the idea that you did need agglomeration on a bigger scale. Because there were some things like high value manufacturing, but not specific to the North East, they're common to Lancashire, they're common to Sheffield City region. And if you think globally, nobody else has cities as small as we do in terms of their travel to work areas. That's broadly why they underperform. And so it does matter that the metro trains and the new ones haven't started working yet, because every incremental investment you make in infrastructure does bring some benefits. And I'll finish just on a couple of stats, because actually, if you compare what was the Northeast sort of top combined authority, that was the bit that's this side of the river, and uh, Tees Valley with other parts of the North of England, other than Greater Manchester in the last 50 years, in productivity terms, actually, they are doing some of the best. The bit between here and Tees Valley, which is the most disconnected by public transport, has is most disconnected from any large economic centres, has performed much worse. And I think the big challenge for the new combined authority is how do you address the fact that this city, which is absolutely an engine of economic growth, even 20 years ago, 100,000 people a day were meeting in here, does not have enough benefit to the rest of the region. And that's because it is profoundly difficult to get here. There are parts of the Teton and Weir region that do not have a train station. If you go to Washington, where the new metro extension would go, it's the largest town, I think, one of the largest towns in the country. Um, but doesn't have a train station with a large account in, in Europe that doesn't have a train station. If you're in Washington, it is not practical as a young person to get a job here if your bus is not going to reliably get you to work. And so, Washington, you could almost walk there to Austin, right?
I could be this evening. Never. Time will get back, get back to London. I could be walked to Washington. Whether I'd walked or not, I'd be pitch dark. I don't know. But the, the point of that point, what I'm trying to get at is that these are very small distances, yet our economy is disconnected. And I'm not a pure agglomerationist. I do think that inequality matters. But I think that to steal kind of something from the Greater Manchester story that Torsten and others have done some work on as part of the journey that led to their reports, you do need to have economic growth to be able to redistribute benefits. And I think sometimes in the economic debate in this region, we're very keen to talk about a way to distribute all the social goods that we think we need, because we do need them. But we do have to have a way to generate those goods in the first place. And that does require some really hard conversations about what are the real diamond constraints, which is the phrase that Bulls and uh, his uh, standpoint of use. And in the case of the North East, that's about to what extent does innovation funding generate high school jobs for the graduates who generate, and to what extent is transport stopping our economy from growing. If you fix those two things, and you do the things that are fundamentally keeping the most poor people out of opportunities in this region, you will get progress, but you have to do both at the same time. And they are absolutely linked together, because in this part of the country, inequality is a barrier to, to, to travel to work area and to, to labour market mass. Labour market's about making them bigger, but they also don't include lots of people, they don't function either. And so thinking about building bigger labour markets that include more people who live in places, but also are larger, I think is fundamentally what the North East problem is, because you can see that the bit in the middle of the North East is doing worst, and that's because it is the bit that doesn't really form part of a genuinely dynamic and a labour market with any real future and any real economic drivers. And that is a real challenge if you're in those kind of traditional technologies and communities that are disconnected from the opportunities and assets that do exist in other parts of the region. Great, that was depressing, but great. Well, <laughs> Does that have interest? What, what are people's levels of perkiness about having a new combined authority? Let's go for hands up if it's very perky. Yes, perky. Hands up if it's kind of a bit suicidal. It's very bad. It's very bad. Anyone think it's very bad? He didn't no invite, one. Didn't invite Dominic Cummings. Well, now he does <laughs> like evolution. Does no one think? No one thinks it's bad. That's very boring. Like dangerous. It. Dangerous consensus. Anyone think it's totally irrelevant? Going to make no difference either way. Come on, people, one of you does. I don't believe that. All, no, so, you can't not all think it's a complete triumph. <laughs> but the, the perkiest audience in the world ever. Very good. Right, Beth? It's quite a lot of Treasury officials here, so that's Yeah, they can't vote. <laughs> They're not allowed to vote the Treasury. <laughs> um, uh, thanks very much. Um, so if you'll forgive me, I'm going to come from a slightly different angle and um, just talk very briefly about the role of the civil service in the North East, and particularly what we've been doing at the Darlington economic campus and how I think that this can help um, contribute to some of the challenges that we, we've talked about. Um, as many of you know, there have always been lots of civil servants in the North East. I was one of them many years ago, 20-odd um, years ago, working at the Ministry up the road in, uh, in Long Benton. Um, but over the last few years, I think there's, there's been a really concerted and quite different step change in uh, the approach of the civil service to roles outside London, and in particular having jobs that work at the centre of government, working on policy issues and jobs that uh, go up, right up to the most senior levels um, in the civil service. They've all traditionally been done in, in London for the first time we're seeing those jobs done um, uh, outside London. Um, so in the Darlington Economic Campus, some of you will be uh, maybe aware, so that was set up about three years ago. Um, uh, nine government departments and agencies um, now have civil service jobs based there. There were always um, about 700 um, Department for Education civil servants in the town, but nearly all doing sort of corporate teachers' pensions, those kind of um, jobs. We now have another 800 new civil service roles there, the most, most of which are what we call policy jobs, so advising on all these sorts of issues um, from the northeast, uh, directly um, advising ministers uh, on them. Um, from the Treasury perspective, so um, we've got 250 Treasury civil servants based in Darlington, um, now working on all sorts of different um, areas of government policy, financial services, tax, spending, uh, you, you name it. Um, there are a few of us, like myself, who've relocated from London, but the vast, vast majority have been, re uh, been recruited directly here in the region. So the Treasury, it's, it's 85, 90% direct uh, direct recruitment or um, people all sorts of different previous experiences public sector private sector um, a lot of whom would never ever have thought of working for the government and for the civil service before so it's just been brilliant to uh, be able to tap into all that uh, all that talent um, we are not a regional office 
Um, uh, Treasury, like most of the departments, um, what we're trying to create uh, in Darlington is what we call a microcosm of the department as a whole. So most people are working on national policy, but obviously we do have a regional dimension and we have um, a particular affinity and need to understand the, uh, what's going on in, the, in the, the northeast. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a second. Our eventual plan in Darlington is to have um, over 2,000 civil servants based in the town. And uh, we are in the process of um, getting planning permission to build uh, a new government hub uh, there. Um, so why is that sort of important and relevant to what we're, we're talking about tonight? Um, I mean, at its most basic, we're creating new jobs for people to work in the civil service who didn't have that opportunity before, and that's great. Um, but those people are providing, you know, a different perspective into policy advice. Yes, we base our policy advice on analysis and evidence, but we're all human beings we, we've all got our own personal perspectives and experience and um, you know that the fact that we have a different set of people providing advice directly in, you know, in the Treasury's case to the Chancellor from from Darlington means you're just getting a different set of um, perspectives I, I won't make the obvious point and uh, particularly on public transport issues um, but um, I think the, um, the the other thing that I am really you know um, proud of and I think is is really relevant to the conversation today is that um, you know, I, I want us to be part of the development of a wider ecosystem of skills and talents in the, in the North East, how we can develop different types of um, jobs here. And you know, one of the things that our staff really love is getting out into local schools and talking about the types of jobs we have at the campus and, and particularly thinking about people who perhaps traditionally might have gone to university here in the North East and then gone to London rather than staying in the region. And I think being able to offer the types of jobs that we, we can in these policy roles, particularly in the civil service um, here in the North East, is a really important part of keeping talent in the, in the region. Um, Darlington Council, if they were here, would also uh, talk to you about the wider impact on the local economy. Um, still early days, but I think um, quite a bit of evidence of, of increased private sector activity, particularly professional services um, firms. But I think this isn't just about job opportunities and the economy, although that is um, you know, very important. I think it's also about us being able to forge a really different set of relationships with, with you and lots of others in the, in the, the, the region, local government, business, universities, um, charities, whatever. And I think actually over the last three years, being able to really start to form a much deeper and richer set of relationships, trusting set of relationships, which I think, you know, we've talked about further devolution in the future, I think can really help um, forge a different set of partnerships between central government, local government and um, uh, other players in the, in the region. And we're just starting to think about how we can really kind of try and exploit that, identifying areas where, whether it's, you know, the lack of scale up capital in the in the northeast, whether it's about um, you know some of the issues on I'm just mentioning some things we've done recently, children's um, social care around different challenges in the labour market. How can we use the campus to convene the types of conversations in a really open and trusted way that you might not necessarily have had um, based in in London. Um, and then the final thing just to mention, and maybe less um, relevant to everybody apart from the uh, people from deck in the room, but um, the, uh, the campus is very much trying to um, operate within the civil service in a very different way. Um, we are, we, we're very proud of the word campus. We are not um, nine individual departments. We are a community together. A lot of what we're trying to do is break down some of the traditional silos and barriers between departments, which we know from the outside is you know, hideous complexity and try and um, you know, find a way to work much more collectively on the problems that we, uh, that we face. So um, I'll stop there, but um, yeah. Great, thank you very much. I think this might be the first event, and I've done a lot of events, where every speaker has stuck to time. So we have actually got 35 minutes. Normally you get about 30 seconds. Um, so well done, team. Uh, right, so let's start um, the one we'll do. Let's start roaming around and getting some questions. So hands up. I've got some things. We're going to do some more interactive polls in a second, which I know you all can't wait for. The, um, uh, right, this gentleman here, Keen, ready to roll. Give us your name, sir. Uh, Richard Baker. Um, <coughs> 
thank you very much for the input. It's very interesting. I, I do agree wholeheartedly with, with the first analysis around productivity inequality. I think there is a third pillar, though, and I think um, I, wondered, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about the third pillar being around the whole question of resilience. I mean, we've had multiple challenges where, you know, COVID, energy, so on and so forth, where the UK has seems to have done particularly badly compared with other countries. Uh, it's clearly, in my mind, linked to the point Henry made around investment. But um, it does also, if you, if you have a run through about the things the North East does really well, like energy and water and food and so on and so forth, there's a whole series of things where this region could make a real impact on some of those resilience challenges. And I just wonder whether we could bring those two things together a bit. Great question. Who else wants to come in to get started? Resilience. Anybody else? That's it. Very good. Lady at the front. And then we're going to the man with the winner beard in the middle afterwards. Go ahead, Babin. Hi, I'm Kaya. I work in the Treasury in the Darlington campus. Um, obviously, like regional inequality has been a really big discussion point for this government and leveling up and leveling up white paper. What do you think, like if you look at the first sort of 100 days of a new government, what do you think they should prioritise implementing to tackle Ooh. regional inequality that the current government isn't prioritising? If there's a new government. <laughs> <laughs> Elections are available. You can make your choice, everyone. Right, sir, and then we'll go to the panel. Thank you. I'm Jonathan Sapsid. I'm from Newcastle University and the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre. So in response to Abigail and, and Henry's presentations, um, in terms of uh, um, the mobility that you need across the northern cities, I think, to build up growth uh, in creative clusters too, when you look at creative clusters that were successful in the southeast, for example, um, and in the southwest, Brighton, Bristol, a lot of them are characterised by a lot of mobility. People moving in to those areas from outside. Um, you know, we have restrictions on that. In the northeast, we have a low population. We have a, a small private sector. A, a number of us, I think, have been working with uh, with the RSA, the BBC, Tracy Brabin, around this idea of the northern creative corridor building on pan-northern ideas of connection across the northern cities and in order to, to build up that sort of scale of investment in innovation, in mobility, in infrastructure, and so on, and the skills agenda particularly, um, which we feel is important, I think, for, for providing that sort of scale and dynamism that you would otherwise lack in these sort of rather disconnected agglomerations. Um, your thoughts on the panel, please. That was very impressive. That was a question at the end. <laughs> Did you snuck it in when I wasn't looking? Right, okay, Henry, why don't you take this really good concrete? Yeah. What do you want done in 100 days and be tough on not everything you want done over 20 years? No, and I think the, 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 most, the, the most important thing is, is something that does sound very, very boring, which is the, doing the single settlement properly, and that would hopefully also include the North East by then. Okay, so the single settlement is very nerdy. We'll talk about fiscal rules later, just so we can cover all the bingo cards people might have brought with them. Um, but we'll just do this for now. Um, so essentially, this is the idea that in other parts of the North that have had devolution a little longer, but not Tees Valley or the North East yet, slightly different reasons to talk about that later, maybe over a drink at the end. Um, but West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Liverpool City region, Greater Manchester, West Midlands have the offer of a single settlement, which means as well as departments getting a budget, because there will be a, a government of some kind, and there will be a CSR that happens to ha happens after the election because the current chancellor's ruled out doing it before this election. So someone is going to have to decide what every department's going to spend for the next five years. And usually those departments all decide what they're going to get, and then they decide where that money should go and what it should be spent on. If you are in an area with a single settlement, you will theoretically be able to bid for money for things that potentially cross those silos. It's a bit like um, Beth was very eloquently talking about how her campus works. That's about also doing budgeting a different way. So even if there isn't a lot of money, which we're sort of assuming is kind of predetermined, you can spend it in different ways. So if you've got some ex-offenders, for example, rather than having a skills budget and a justice budget for those people, you can just spend the money on those people on one set of joined up interventions, assuming you might want to do some policy intervention, rather than spending different pots from different departments, potentially doing contradictory things that don't join up. Um, and I think the reason it's really important is Rachel Reed gave a very uh, sensible answer to a question at a Fabian conference about a year and a half ago, where she basically said, 
which no one really noticed because no one was really thinking about the Labour government at the time, that she was as open to dealing with mayors as she was to cabinet ministers when it came to funding requests, that she would spend the money with whoever could get the best outcomes. She wasn't bothered. Now, that's the current single settlement framework is exciting to people like me, but isn't entirely transformative because it only really allows you to move money a little bit between pots. If you took away a lot of that and said, essentially, you would have significant real freedom around spending, potentially the ability to raise some more money by making local tax decisions as part of that journey, then you could genuinely move from the Treasury funding services through departments to those areas that have institutional capability, choosing what to spend money on themselves. And doing that properly in the CSR is the single most important thing you could do in 100 days because passing and you take back control bill, all that would take longer than 100 days. But writing some interesting, important legislation about that would be important. But the most important thing is that the money that goes to mayors is unrestricted for the next five years and a lot less money goes through central departments. which starts to challenge the different dimension of is Whitehall there to enable public spending or is it there to do it? And fundamentally that would rewire it. So in much of the North, almost all the North and much of England as a result, you would essentially have a version of devolution appropriate to this part of the country and equivalent in importance probably to how Scotland and Wales are run, but within a framework that allows for more differentiation between different economic geographies. Can I just, nope. Sorry, can I just add something? So, so I mean, not not to make a, um, I'm obviously not going to get into uh, the part of political vote of what happens after the election. But I think I actually think the interesting thing is I think there's a lot of consensus now about the next steps on devolution across parties in terms of you know taking the single settlements to the to mm. the next level. See, there's less consensus around the sort of tax angle and the tax angle you know to be frank is just complicated because the redistribution uh, side of it is and we start from a very centralized system and moving away from that is is hard i think the other thing to you know we, we talked a bit about second cities and i think again there's a lot of very clear analysis on that but obviously if you really want to make a difference there you're going to have to target more rather than spread the jam thinly and so you know I think a lot of this actually not just on regional growth but growth more generally is about how can we create the political space to be able to do some other things that are actually just quite hard for politicians to to do. And I think that actually includes that because at the moment people talk about the single settlement since we've gone there as being hard for central government to agree to once central government does agree, and it basically broadly is to the theory, lots of combined authorities are suddenly going to find it's actually not that easy to operationalise because they're suddenly going to have to have a, run their own little mini spending reviews and suddenly all the council leaders are going to have to sign off on something. Because remember, the mayor can't tell them what to do. So they're going to find out very quickly. Like real politics, that's what you want. That's what devolution is. Then real politics will turn up where people have got real control of budgets and they'll have to see out whether they can make it work or not. Now, Abigail, Jonathan's question is a really good one, which is on the creative industries. So you were saying the sector doing real really well has got lots of the kind of either current or latent capacities, but lots of the ways people in the academic world think about the creative industries is you want mobility, to, to underpin them and the northeast although everyone says the problem of the northeast is everybody leaves actually the defining feature of the northeast is fewer people arrive and fewer people leave like that's actually why the northeast stands out it isn't true actually everyone's leaving like far fewer people leave the northeast than leave Tunbridge Wells as a share of uh, young people because Tunbridge Wells is really boring uh, no it's not it's because they're rich um, and then the other point is scale so is it big enough so what those, what's our answer do you want more people coming and going fewer people coming and going what would help I think what we wouldn't completely agree with Henry's point that there is a sort of underpinning matter around transport and the transport infrastructure that is absolutely yeah. fundamental and it's fundamental to, to our sector. But I suppose the other thing, thinking about, um, so we've got on um, the other side of the river, the prospect of a conference centre and uh, arena being built in between ourselves and um, Baltic Centre Contemporary Art, what that will do is increase the flow of people coming into the region nationally and, and internationally. And I think getting that door going of people kind of seeing what's here is a, is a kind of component in it, which again is around um, uh, attracting and kind of advertising and kind of creating a narrative for, for the region. Um, so, so yes, we want people both in and out. We want we want kind of connectivity rather than, than this sense that there's an island or a kind of uh, a special place that we all know about. Um, but I guess um, the, the transport 
coming in and out and within is absolutely fu fundamental to that, alongside what are the education and skills uh, opportunities for the region. I think that, you know, um, question was, you know, 100, 100 days, yeah. I would say, I mean, completely agree about um, um, single settlement, but a, a second thing from me would be around a commitment to uh, reform for the 21st century in education and, and skills, and I think that would make a massive difference here. Oh, good. Cara, Richard rightly says, resilience, also resilience is kind of where a lot of the debate is. <coughs> How does that fit in? Yeah, I think it's a really important point. I mean, I think we've seen what happens when you go through a massive economic, like global economic shock, like the cost of living crisis, and you are in the UK, and we've gone through, you know, 15 years of relative decline. That's a fit, particularly affected incomes at the bottom end of our kind of income distribution. Um, and you can see that sort of those households have gone in particularly kind of vulnerable to those, those effects. I think it's um, kind of talks a little bit to what Henry was talking about. Of, Obviously, it's really important how we deal with kind of redistribution within the UK, but becoming kind of a richer country as well and kind of achieving that, that sort of higher growth and that higher relative growth within our countries is so crucially important when you get big global shocks um, in terms of improving the kind of um, the, the resilience of households and poorer households of households in the UK um, when those big shocks come along. When did we last open a reservoir in Britain? 15 years ago. Anyone want to have a go? Let's have a year. Not the panel. Go on. You say you've got a year. Seventy-six. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> no, it's more recently than that. There was no people in Britain. Remember, there was no migration in the seventies or eighties. Everyone was leaving in the seventies and eighties. You didn't need to build it. Anyone else? A bit more recent than that. It's really bad. So you've got that's it. Turn to the back. Ninety-four. Ninety-four. Nearly a winner. Nineteen ninety-two was the last. Remember, we basically opened a reservoir more or less every year from the eighteen fifties through to nineteen ninety-two. A few gaps. We even managed to open them during world wars, which is quite impressive. Um, lots in the big ones in the Peak District, Durham Water, anyone been there? Not Durham Water, what do I mean? I mean, um, what's the huge one? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's on the Durham, what's the yeah. rest? Lady Bower, thank you. Lady Bower opens in the middle of the Second World uh, War, and we didn't open a single one since 1992. How much has the population grown since 1992? 10 million people, not one reservoir. And that's going to your question, which is like, and if there's one thing you took away, the book's quite long, as you're now going to find out, now that Rob's given you a free book at the back. Uh, but if you took one thing away from it is you can't be a country that just doesn't invest in its future and then be surprised that you turn out poor when stuff happens because, you know, and waters and waters are a really nice, easy one to think about, but it applies everywhere, basically, in what we, um, what we do. Why can't we connect our renewable energy projects to our grid quick enough? Because we haven't been putting the money into invested it until right, until we, uh, until we needed it. Right, let's do a poll and then we'll take some more questions. So Henry basically asked you this question, but he did it politely, um, but I don't have to do that. Um, so here's the question, which is, so we talked about getting growth up and getting inequality down. And what Henry said is totally right, which is that lots of these events around the country, people are under, for good reasons. So the Northeast is a place, as we were talking to a few of you about earlier, uh, with the high child poverty rate. So there's a lot of poor households. The, um, I'm, not, I'm on the board of the Child Poverty Action Group, so I care about that. But which of these two things is harder in the Northeast? So not for the country as a whole, which is harder? Is it harder to get inequality down, or is it harder to get growth up? Which is the one that we should be most anxious for? We need to do both. Like, again, the book's basically saying, people on the left want to get inequality down, people on the right want to get growth up. Stop having around people, we've got to do both these things because the lack of both of them is what is stuffing us. So which is harder in the Northeast? So who thinks getting inequality down is harder? And who thinks getting growth up is the hard one? So I'm putting, you down as, I'm putting that down as narrow majority for it's harder to get inequality down. Here's just a way to think about that. I'm not going to give you the answer because we're going to find out which is harder by hopefully trying. But um, how, what is the Northeast unusual for? So it, the Northeast is not more unequal than most parts of the UK. The Northeast is more equal. Why is the Northeast more equal? Because you do have poor people as compared to the UK as a whole, but there's not many rich people. So the Northeast inequality is actually low. Growth is very unusually low. So I'm not sure, I think I'm going to go with the minority, which is why Henry was politely nudging you about. Right, let's get some more, let's get some three more questions. There's a lady here with a lanyard. I hope it's not, I hope it's not a rainbow one. You'll get banned from the civil service in seconds if you do that. It's not. Um, Lucy Dixon from Carbon Homes, our housing association based in uh, northeastern Yorkshire. Um, it's relevant to what you were just talking about in terms of how does the panel think that the new 
um, elected mayor could work on ensuring that what inequality there is within the region is tackled and so that you know, it's not just about bringing more growth to Newcastle, as Henry was saying, which can be a bit of an issue, but that, that growth is seen in small, you know, mining towns in Durham, um, yeah. in places like Washington, as Henry alluded to, where they struggle with multiple um, yeah. uh, deprivation levels. Great question. Who else wants to come in? There's a gentleman right at the back, and there's a gentleman definitely with a colourful lanyard at the front. But I think it's the living wage. And we set the living wage, so I'm very proud of you. Everyone else get one of these lanyards. Well, go ahead, sir, give us your name. Hello, I'm, I'm John Shackleton. I'm a secondary school teacher in Blythe in Northumberland. I think I'm perhaps repeating the question a little bit there about centres of economic growth. Yeah. Um, so there's been, as far as I've understood it, a lot of talk about Newcastle being a centre and transport links to Newcastle. Um, but Blythe, where I'm teaching at the minute, is a centre of energy, uh, so new energy development and things like that. And a lot of our students are, are keen to stay in Blythe and to want to work in Blythe and make that town better. So what is it that we can do to make sure that Blythe and Washington and Peter Lee, etc., are centres of economic growth as well? Great question. And there's a gentleman down by the front, Rob. Hello there, I'm David from the... Uh, Living Wage Foundation. Oh, you're from the Living Wage Foundation. Um, what one of the, the parties that might be elected has been making noises about a real living wage. Um, we know that 70% of uh, kids in child poverty are, are living in a household where somebody works. But aside from the, the kind of moral arguments around the likes of child poverty and, and such like, we also know that when poorer people are paid a bit more, they spend that money in the local economy. How important is the real living wage in enabling that growth and uh, reduction in inequality you're talking about? And what could we all be doing about that? Very good. Nice, nice bit of action orientation at the end there. Right, come on, you're going to definitely go in first, Henry, on, like, because that is a great question. The conversion of your question is one of the most common questions that comes up around the country, sometimes with more of a, like, all the buggers in central Manchester have got all the shiny goods. How do we get some? And, but sometimes, this is a more a moderate version, I would say, you're kind of offering this. But we're going to do it better, then. So in that, it's a, a sort of old thing time to strip. I wrote a report about Blythe. So we did some work on towns uh, a couple of years ago, before the pandemic. We looked at Blythe, we looked at Bury, and we looked at um, Ghoul. And the point about it is, I, if, you, if you look at the new train line that's been built between Blythe and Ashington and Newcastle, I'm as interested in the people who go and work at the businesses in Blythe who choose to live in Newcastle as I'm in people from Blythe who commute here. And it was uh, our president, George Osborne, who Beth used to work for, um, who I never ever thought when I was working and living here I would end up working for, but I do and did for a number of years. You don't need to justify yourself. No, but I would say... We all make lifestyle choices, it's fine. And I, and I, but I think it, it comes back... He made the argument about Reading and London. People used to commute from Reading to London, now people commute in the other direction. Uh, and it's a very well-made argument. Uh, and I... I think my, my kind of in, the point about agglomeration economics is that the, the most prosperous towns are usually those that are connected to the nearest city. Actually, most of the big cities in the UK are very poor. Manchester is one of the poorest councils in the country. Yes, it generates economic value, but it largely goes out of its city. The problem in the northeast is that um, we, 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 haven't, we haven't got good enough at uh, enabling people who live in places that aren't Newcastle to benefit from its growth. Does that make sense? And I do think one of the challenges to the new combined authority is I'm very interested in the rest of the North East. I spent years uh, working with Lucy and other people in this part of the country on those sorts of challenges, right? And th they're very interesting problems and issues. But fundamentally, Newcastle is not the problem. Do you mean? There is nobody in the North East who is poorer because Newcastle is doing well. Newcastle needs to do better and then it will generate more of the spillover benefits that other places benefit from. But I do think there are some people, and some of them work with you, Henry Open, and others who have a view that, that somehow economic growth can just be driven by successful cities. That may be a simplification of his argument, but it's to make a point. If you look at the north of England, a quarter of our economy is based in our sort of main capabilities, energy, digital, advanced manufacturing, and health and life sciences. That is not distributed all in cities. Many of the knowledge intensive jobs that service those things in financial services, professional services, universities are based in cities, but a lot of the physical assets are not in city centres. And one of the problems of the North East is you want graduates from Newcastle to be able to get trained to work and live in Newcastle and work in Blythe, and that their fates need to be tied to the young people who choose to live in Blythe, because in the end, it doesn't matter 
if they work in Blythe or not, to the local economy. What matters long term to Blythe is to people who are successful and get good jobs, are they able to stay living in Blythe? So your kids, they should aspire if they want to be able to work in Blythe, but ideally they should be able to live in Blythe and be successful whether they choose to work there or not. The problem with the North East moment is young people are disconnected from opportunities that are not in their place. And so their fates are determined by the, the, the quality of the connectivity they have to neighbouring places. And successful places are able to retain successful people who want to live there but don't necessarily work there. That is how regional economics has to work. And the North East just has too many dark spots where you cannot, if you don't have access to a car, get to good quality jobs or opportunities that get you to a good quality job. It's travel to learn, travel to work, all these things intermesh together. But fundamentally, no one in Blythe doesn't benefit from Newcastle doing well, but that A19 corridor is important to the North East as our city centres. It's not a zero-sum game, you need both to do well. And ideally, in a well-functioning market economy, those things will feed off each other. The problem is the moment in the North East that the benefits of neither accruing to the other because they're too disconnected, partly by transport, also, just because those ecosystems are part of developed. Can I just ask something? So, I mean, there was obviously quite a lot of debate at the point um, that the Darlington Economic Campus was set up about it being located in a town rather than a city. And uh, it's one of the things that I love about it that it is in, in a town for all sorts of things which I can go on about. But I think what is really interesting is that at the time, even quite um, uh, you know, prestigious and um, experienced um, uh, people who advise on you know, where to locate a business or whatever said, you can't possibly locate there because you won't be able to recruit the people that you need. That is absolute rubbish. But the reason it's rubbish is because Darlington is really, really well connected, right? And if you actually look, we have a very large travel to work area, but it is all up that north-south railway line, basically. And um, there's a bit into the Tees Valley, but actually, like, the, you know, it, it all comes back to this transport point. So I think, yeah. Exactly. Um, I think one of the biggest dangers in this whole regional economic debate in the country is this kind of the only thing we like to worry about more than like north south divides or like bashing London is the most fun thing, right? But once we've done that, we've got some time left. Okay. Then basically the internal row within a region is like what everyone loves, so like Wigan versus Manchester. And it is it's just not right. But like, there are some individual things that can be true, right? Individual investment decisions. But for a whole, like we are all in it together. Like basically, regions are all in it together. The only way you're going to have a successful North East is if you have a successful Newcastle. One of the reasons why we're not having a more successful North East is because Newcastle, although like people like to say it's booming, it's not doing as well as it should do. And we're all poorer, the whole region's poorer as a result. So we are all in it together, whether we like, you know, we might, might not even like that in some cases, but that's like, it's true for the country and it's true um, in regions. Um, do you want to come in on? Because people do, people definitely say in the cultural sphere, oh, the big cities get it all. You know, I've got to come to Newcastle to see a big show or even worse, I've got to go to London to see something. So how do we spread that out? Well, I, th I, I suppose a couple of points that I'd make um, in relation to the way it's structured and the kind of movement of decision making so that funding is allocated in, in, a, in a particular place, it seems to me that something uh, that's, that's kind of crucial in that is what is then the wiring of that to central um, central government and what remains there. So thinking about um, where where work happens, your question there about, um, so I've got to come to Newcastle or I've got to go to London to see a big show at the Empire or the, or the Theatre Royal, for example, to use the, um, examples. Clearly, there's some kind of practical things there that mean that that, that happens. But if you've got a kind of good um, infrastructure and kind of system that distributes nationally, then that gets but that when, when you, what you then want is the distribution of um, support and funding and, and kind of access to, to cultural provision that goes beyond that. It's going to, going to look different, different in different places, but, but you want that to kind of go further. And that is definitely starting to happen. But all we need to do is kind of wire the system more effectively, which I think has read across, across the whole of, 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 of this, this kind of matter. How do you link? what's happening in a place with what's happening centrally. I suppose the final thing that I might say, if that's all right, is around um, an international perspective. Partly, I think, because of that kind of rat run that we've got from Edinburgh to King's Cross, 
we tend to kind of look in, in that direction and that is home base. But what if home base was Europe and, and a kind of international perspective and how we were uh, thinking about those sets of, of relationships? I think there's a lot more for us to do with the region there. Yeah, good. On, on your question on um, living wages, so those of you not spending your lives in this world, we've got the national living wage, government set, George Osborne, now back in fashion, uh, get the podcast and the t-shirt. Um, national living wage, basically the rebranded minimum wage, right? And then we've got the living, real living wage, the gentleman works for, we set. So there's a two number of things. One is I think it's good to do some good news. So like the, the national living wage, the minimum wage in Britain is now at levels. Like the only countries that are on a par with us are really kind of New Zealand, Korea, a bit of France. He said to me 20 years ago when the minimum wage came in, we were going to end up there. I'd have been like, not a chance. I mean, what does that mean? It means that in pay inequality, hourly pay inequality is now probably back to pre thatcher levels, which is not, you know, good to celebrate. Some, one kind of inequality has come down massively. Like, we've, you know, the number of people in low pay has come down on that measure. And that then should point us onto the things, because the progress on that stands in, like, as the other book sets out, in stark contrast to basically not making progress on almost any other aspect of the nature of work. So like, another thing that the Living Wage Foundation works on is what's called living hours. Because what a lot of what you hear from lower earners is, I can only work short hours. And remember, our living standards are about weekly pay, how much we actually take home, not how much we get paid for each hour we work. And if I can't get the hours, then I'm going to be poor. And that's what's sitting behind your statement on high levels of in-work poverty. It's not because, in general, going into work does reduce your poverty chances a lot. So we shouldn't forget that. Working poverty is the main bit of poverty, but going into work definitely reduces your poverty risk. And that definitely matters in some parts of the Northeast, so we shouldn't forget that. But the reason why the working poverty rates are too low is a lot to do with um, how many hours people are either able to work because of their life, it's complicated, they, um, or how many they're choosing to work. Partly if you talk to people because they say that you know, the job's rubbish and I don't want to spend 20 hours in it because it's going to get me down. They, um, yeah, and, they, on, and things, on things to take it up. I mean, I know the Labour Party has said it wants to consider um, put the national living wage reflecting the cost of living I suspect it may not change that much. Uh, I don't think they're going to nationalise you yet, but you never mind. If they do, there's employment protections. I know some good lawyers. We can we can get you uh, we can get you looked after. Right, let's get another. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Um, so I think the other interesting thing about the national living wage is that it has been an example of successfully having an external institution that has created cross-party consensus generally on it over a period of time. So it hasn't become a political yeah. football. So I guess there's some interesting questions. Tell people what that one is. The, the, the low pay uh, commission that basically advises it has trade unions and business organisations and it advises the government every year on the national living wage and has meant I think that it, it has had a lot of consensus around it so it's a kind of interesting question about could you recreate that more in other in other places actually just to make you feel good about yourself which is good I didn't think we would ever be able to see the real living wage turn up in the wages data i.e. that there would be enough people that would be big enough that I could see it in the pay distribution and it looks like it might be it looks we've now got enough people either signed up formally as your members or who just pay it anyway because they don't want to get shouted at even if they're not signed up to give you any cash yeah it looks like we can now see it as like a little spike in the pay distribution so i thought i'd share some perk with you right let's get one last round of questions let's get these two together thank you so much um sam from northumbria university also a proud Washington resident, so uh -huh. looking forward to my hour-long wait for the 56 bus home. <laughs> I think we've heard a lot about the challenges of the Northeast, which is very apt. I want to know what your perspectives, either the people who are here all the time as residents or the people who are coming to the region, what are the unique opportunities and unique strengths of the area? And maybe in comparison to the Birmingham's, the Bristol's, what, what could be the thing that lifts this region up? Great question. Lady in front of you. Um, I, I'm interested in your views on how the way we make public investment choices is affecting our ability to focus on maybe some of the basics and fundamentals that might help us with some of these challenges. We've we talked a lot about um, transport infrastructure, um, but is that one of the things that's meaning this is a long-term crisis? Great. Gentlemen here. Uh, anyone else? Because I'm going to wrap up after this round. Yes, and I'll take the lady behind. Hi, I'm Finzen. I work at the Treasury as well, full disclosure. Um, I was just intrigued by the conversation about mobility because I struggle. I live in Darlington, obviously, 
And the closest capital to Darlington is not London, it's in fact Amsterdam, because the flight is 50 minutes. How important is international mobility to driving regional growth outside of London, and what can be done to either encourage or discourage it? That's a good question. Um, I, obviously, we've spoken a lot about connectivity, uh, and I think we've all agreed that connectivity is a big issue in the Northeast. However, unlike a lot of North, well, a lot of combined authorities, the Northeast is quite big geographically in scale, mm -hmm. um, and basically devolution has only will provide us with only a set amount of funding. How do you? What are your views on how do you prioritize that funding? It's not going to go a long way mm -hmm. if we're being honest. And how do you also raise additional funding without creating more inequality in the region? Very good. Okay, there's a really good range of questions. I mean, all of you should do the opportunity to question is a great question because that's what actually gets you to what should we do rather than what should we like get, get down about. So that's really good. So why don't everyone do that bit, but then we can go through the different um, uh, the different bits as we um, go. But do you want to go on public investment choices, how we make them? Yes. Obviously without, without no prejudice to actual decisions. I mean, look, you know, it's a completely um, uh, fair point that we have not exactly had a period of certainty and stability um, in lots of different ways over the last... And we hadn't noticed that. We were like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, from a sort of official <laughs> perspective, we'd really like to get back to that. So being able to set long-term budgets, obviously, in, you know, traditionally Goodness, set budgets for three years, in some areas set budgets for five years. I think, you know, for, we've... I think there's a case for doing it for longer than that in some areas like uh, transport. Obviously, that's a decision for uh, for the for the for the government. Um, I think things like having a, a single fiscal event, which Labour have talked about, and it's no secret it's the Treasury officials' dream, uh, because this point that just tinkering around with the system is not is not helpful for stability and uncertainty. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that is definitely something we will be advising whichever government comes in to to have more long term certainty, particularly around capital investment. Apart from having the campus. What other opportunities do the North East have? Is there anything else you want to highlight? I, I, I think, well, a couple of things. So, I mean, I think there is something, um, you know, I'm an interloper. I've been here before and gone away and come back and I'm not born and bred in the North East. But, you know, there is a tremendous sense of community and connection in the North East. And lot, lots of people know each other. And I mean that in a sort of positive way, in the sense that there's a great, like, network and sense of, like, so I think that is a real opportunity in itself in terms of, you know, forging consensus and partnership. And as you said, there's a real moment of opportunity with the, the new combined authority. I do also think it's, you know, there is no doubt that there is a story about the North East and the opportunity of, um, you know, net zero and uh, and climate change and, and in, you know, industrial strategy around green industries that I think is really cutting through. So that is something I think to really, really build on. Very good. I mean, I'll give us your perk and any other answers while you're... I think we're at risk of repeating ourselves. So pe people, I think, are the greatest asset here and the culture that people have. And that um, is a kind of really uh, sort of can-do, resilient, make-things-happen kind of way. Um, there's a heritage there to, to build on. And there's a set of things that are emergent that if we back them and prioritise them could really kind of flourish. So uh, things like uh, green energy and tech, the creative sector, screen, music, um, th those kind of areas. And also data and data and research. I think we're building a kind of real yeah. reputation there. So there's a set of things that I think if we um, get clear and, and kind of really push them, um, then, then they're there and up for grabs. And then in terms of kind of what we've got physically, we've got a bit of everything, both in terms of kind of geography, as um, somebody said, we're the biggest de devolved geography, but we've got coast, countryside, um, towns and cities. And across that, although it's modest in scale, we've, we've also got a little bit of everything. So thinking about my sector, we've got a cultural infrastructure that we've built uh, over time, that's, that's, there's a footprint, if you like, so there's something to kind of build from. So I think there's, there's, there's loads. Good. On this, so the geography can be an opportunity, but it, it obviously is harder in some ways than, like the, what the economic geography plan is, where you put your resources is easier in Greater Manchester than here in some ways. How does that work? And then give us your perk as well. Uh, so not everywhere is lucky to have a city centre surrounded by sort of nice, pretty uh, local authorities will make a nice circle. Uh, that's easier. 
uh, for devolution to work. Uh, and like we were trying to do a devolution deal government in one form or another when I was still in local government here, and that was quite a long time ago. So it's taken a long time. I, I wouldn't be mystified by the kind of rural geography and the beneficiaries, right? Because in reality, Greater Manchester has a rural hinterland. It's just not in Greater Manchester. It's in Cheshire. Yeah. It's in Lancashire. Yeah. So most big urban conurbations have an impact way beyond their geography. But the urban areas in the northeast are where most of the development's going to go in terms of where the growth is going to be. So unless rural communities suddenly discover they want to have a gigafactory in their back garden, you're not going to spend a lot of your combined authority pot. But many of the people who live in those rural communities commute to whether it's southeast Northumberland or into urban, more developed industrial areas in County Durham. So it's not about, it, we talked a bit earlier about jam spreading and that is the ultimate enemy, right? What you need to do in this context because you need to put your money where you're going to have the greatest private sector leverage and the most significant longer term impact rather than short term initiatives. So what's the most successful thing Greater Manchester have done? They've not, it's not the things they've given away. So the Housing Investment Recyclable Fund, which enabled a load of the development to happen in Greater Manchester has been recycled eight, nine times over. And when you look at the, all the shiny towers in Manchester, you go, oh, this is all very shiny and exciting. That is private money, but it has been underpinned by the public sector taking risks that the private sector at the time couldn't do about 10 years ago. So there, is a, there are good examples of some of the things that the North East Combined Authority have done around, because they didn't have transport, they had to do other interesting things. Actually, the chief exec and the team there have done some very interesting things about stimulating and crowding in private investment, I think that is really important because that's how you get more from your limited pot. I would argue the opportunity in the Northeast is probably net zero, not because it's nice and great to wear hemp sandals. Please wear hemp sandals if you like them. I'm not being rude about it. I'm just saying the Northeast opportunity is that it's about the jobs, not about doing it for its own sake. And my greatest regret and thing that we haven't landed in the Gigafactory in Blythe, and there are, there's more Latin in Blythe, right? We can do more in Camboa, but. It's that those big opportunities have sometimes landed, sometimes not here. I think the kind of the, the, the institutional levers you now have to make more of those decisions locally and change the investment environment will mean that those good things that happen in the Northeast happen more often. And when you think about the connectivity of your smaller businesses to some of those bigger projects, you can do more of the wiring to make sure that more of the supply chain, the opportunities and that um, genuine ecosystem around manufacturing and net zero where they meet. That is, I think, a unique Northeast capability. It's not that I don't like life science, it's not like I don't like other startups, but in terms of the specialisation of the Northeast, it's unique in having those net zero assets and a big manufacturing pedigree. That means it should get a bigger chunk of that than other parts of the UK. At the moment, the data isn't clear that's happening, but it doesn't mean the opportunity to do it isn't there. Great. Cara, anyone want to come in on? Any perk you want to share? Yeah, I guess. Well, it feels like for a lot of different areas of the UK, there's a sort of danger of either you've seen kind of a bit of kind of growth and then thought, well, that's it, job's done. I think sort of Greater Manchester sometimes when we were doing bits of work there, there was a worry that that was kind of the seeing lots of growth, problem solved. And I guess the other end of the spectrum, maybe areas where it feels like, you know, kind of things haven't improved, there's a bit of kind of fatalism of just we've been left behind. This is kind of all terrible. And it feels like with the sort of creation of the combined authority, it was a real opportunity um, for kind of new. Um, approaches to economic strategies here, it feels like kind of you, uh, the Northeast has a real opportunity to avoid sort of both of those, those kind of, the worse. That sounds good. Yeah, very good. Now we didn't answer Fenton's question, which is on how does mobility fit in? So without a long economic lecture, um, I think we should split two, th here's a medium one though, just to split, to keep two things separate in our heads. So most of the mobility we've been talking about, that's the kind of, the bit where Britain stands out for being rubbish, by Britain, we, I mean out of south of southeast Britain, is is mobility that's about the labour market. So it's about can you get to and from work? Is your local area working like a highly functioning region where business will want to be because there's a large labour pool and a couple that's you know a couple that's got two of them working can possibly base themselves because they know there's enough work for them both. They're both going to be able to travel to without their lives being hell. And all the rest. So that's the and that's so that's the labour market mobility, and that's the thing that's a problem even in GM, even after all the metro, like and definitely in Birmingham and the rest and here. The um, you're raising the international mobility, which doesn't matter for labour market reasons. Even the even the within region, the across region mobility doesn't matter really. Like yes, some people work in live in Newcastle, work in London, some people work in London, live in London, work in Newcastle, but it doesn't matter massively. The numbers are just too small. You can't run a labour market on big intercity train lines. You're running it on small local um, trade lines, but it does matter for exports and trade. 
So you can see it there. So you, it matters for like, and it's the same is true as for airports. So service trade is tied to airports. So Manchester's airport is really important for Manchester, London, many airports are very important for their international trade because that's very clear in the data, but it doesn't massively matter. I think sometimes people say it matters for everything, matters for everything. And it's really important to know which ones are matter for different things. And, the, and that's the easiest way to think about them. And it'd then be like, which one is more important for where Britain is today? And it's the, it's the like more local. I don't want to say it's hyper-local transport, but it's the what you've all been asking about, which is like, how do you make sure, the question you asked, that, uh, Madam, how do you make sure that everyone in the region is connected to the labour market? And that is the more local transport. But, you know, it's nice to have an airport. Right, we're going to wrap up. Can we all thank our panel for all their thoughts today? And uh, thank you all for coming. There isn't such a thing as a free lunch, but there is such a thing as a free book, and there might be some leftover booze, so go and grab them. See you soon.